<laughs> Thank you. Welcome to Star Talk Live at the Keswick Theater. All right. I am Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist, and I always do this with a co-host. My co-host tonight is going to be and is Chuck Nice. Chuck, where are you, man? <laughs> What's up, buddy? Chuck Nice. What's up, Philly? Some of you know Chuck is a Philly native. That's right. Born and bred, Philadelphia. That's why I know we're not actually in Philadelphia. <laughs> you know, but it, you know, it doesn't really work when you walk out like, what's up, Glenside? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't work. That, 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 that wouldn't work. Uh, so, Chuck. Yeah, man. So I, I think we're in Philadelphia. It's very and, cool. You know, Star Talk is about science, right? I did not know that. <laughs> So I, so I thought to myself, let's talk about like a cool, important, interesting scientist who we associate with Philadelphia. Will Smith. <laughs> is he from Philadelphia? He is from Philly, West Philadelphia, born and raised from what I hear. <laughs> and uh, uh, he's a slapologist. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about perhaps Philadelphia's most sa famous scientist, which many other people think of him as just a founding father. Of course, we're talking about Benjamin Franklin. All right. So uh, let's get started. So, Chuck, what do you know about Benjamin Franklin? Oh, man, I know he's got a parkway. I know he's got a bridge. <laughs> I know he got an institute. <laughs> I know he's on a hundred dollar bill. <laughs> exactly. Oh man. Uh, yeah. Bill, that, it's all. You about look at this like you've never seen a hundred. Do we not pay you enough? Uh, let me tell you something. This is you just. I can't even talk anymore. That's how much I love money and Ben Franklin. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. So that's that's good. So. We know, we associate him, at least in the scientific community, with his discoveries on electricity. Of course. Okay, and uh, electricity and lightning. I got a lot to say about lightning. People think they understand lightning, but usually they don't, even if they think so. Because, you know, lightning strikes from the ground up, not from the clouds to the ground. Did you uh, know that? Yeah, too? tell that to the, the, every Greek painting that I've seen. <laughs> But what else? He, uh, ben Franklin was a printer, okay? That's right. And he printed, and, and people don't know this, Chuck, you come from a printer family. And every printer in the world loves Ben Franklin. I love Ben Franklin because my father was a printer, and if it weren't for Ben Franklin, I would have starved as a child. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you, but you worked in the printing factory with him. With my dad, yes, and I actually ran something called a raised letter press, which is what he pretty much invented, yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. And Ben Frank was also a successful businessman. He uh, so, did so many things, and I don't have particular expertise on this. Okay. I'm, I'm just saying. So we, we, gotta, we, we gotta do this Star Talk style, and we combed the landscape for an expert on Benjamin Franklin. You know where we landed? At the oh. Yale Library, oh. which is undergoing a multi-year project to collect the complete papers of Benjamin Franklin. Wow. So we got the editor-in-chief of that project here today. Please give a warm Philly welcome to Ellen Cohen, editor-in-chief of the Benjamin Franklin Cohen. Papers Project. <laughs> Ellen Where Cohen! Is she? There she goes. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen Cohen. Ellen, come on, ha please have a seat. Ellen. This is what makes this show so great. We just cheered for a librarian. <laughs> That's a There's nothing better in the world than that, okay? <laughs> Except here's the thing, I'm not a librarian. Okay, like I said, <laughs> we just cheered for an editor-in-chief. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so let me ask you, Ellen, you're editor-in-chief of this project. 
Um, Benjamin Frank was prolific, so this means it's a big project. Yep. And how long have you been at this? Okay, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, how, I mean, how long, what, how do we, do, how, how long? Uh, since I was in diapers. Yeah, okay, yeah? No, we're talking 40 years. 40, 40 years? Yes. Yeah. And that got you through how far in his life? Well, look, here's the thing. We started our project back in 1954, and the idea was to collect every single thing that we could find around the world that Benjamin Franklin wrote, and also everything that he received. So it's both sides of the correspondence. And um, you know, when he invented lightning, we're only like in volume four. <laughs> and I just handed in volume 44 to the Yale Press. Um, it wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, it was a really tough volume. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, and there's, so um, in all, there are gonna be 47. I mean, this guy was amazing, and uh, uh, about half of those volumes covers the period when he was in France during the Revolution. Um, and so how much of that did you, uh, I mean, we think of him as a founding father, and nowhere on the $100 bill, ooh. is there any, I oh, sorry, <laughs> is there any indication that he was a scientist? Yeah. So what percent of his papers and his body of work is reflected, reflects his capacity as a scientist in all of that correspondence. Well, you know, here's the amazing thing about him is that his entire life he was interested in science. Um, he was so curious about everything that he saw. As any good scientist should be, okay? So like- It's not like you're gonna find too many scientists are like, what's that? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, <laughs> like, just to give you an example, how many people of his day, or how many of you, have ever sat in a darkened room with a fire going in the fireplace, and there's a candle on the table? Now, Benjamin Franklin noticed that the smoke from that candle was traveling in a certain direction. And he thought, huh, that's interesting. And he made it his business to try to find out why. I mean, that's the kind of guy he was his entire life. Oh, so if it was life. a lit candle. Yes, I'm <laughs> sorry, I did to, like, why would the candles start floating through <laughs> the air? Okay, so he's saying normally <clears throat> the smoke of a candle would go straight up. He's got a fireplace going, and now the smoke is going towards the fire. So he notices this and asks, himself what's going on. What's going on? That's, a, that's a, an observant, curious person. Yeah. Yes, because all I would have thought is, why am I here alone? <laughs> 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 this setting is very, very sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so he didn't, so something I didn't, I never knew, I know a little bit about Ben, but did he, he didn't study science in school? So here's the thing, this kid, um, was the 15th child oh. in a family of 17 children. Wow, um, his poor mother. <laughs> his poor mothers. Mothers? Well, that is to say he only First of all, <laughs> I don't need you bringing that kind of stuff into my school system. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing you'll be up here talking about your Ben Franklin critical race theory. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she meant he was raised by two mothers. Oh, okay. I'm pretty sure that's not the... Yeah, that's okay. it. Oh, my goodness gracious. I walked right into that one. <laughs> well, yeah. so, uh, I don't know if you know, I've, um, I have some expertise in the fabric of the space-time continuum. Did you know this? Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you did, did you know this too? Uh, yeah, okay. So. Also, I have a watch. <laughs> <laughs> so there. So I was experimenting on this and I was able to open a portal through time. Right. And I got Benjamin Franklin. And I'm starting to get a little worried, to be honest, okay. right now. 
Because what I know is Neil does not smoke marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I brought him through. And then I'm I said, why don't I just bring him here? And so then I got in an Uber, and he didn't. And so I lost him. Neil and Ben's not so excellent adventure. Because <laughs> <laughs> that I would be fun if we had Ben Franklin here. But so, but I, I don't know where he is. He's wandering the streets of Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's what you don't know. I would think that that was like a fantastical story, except that I actually found Ben Franklin. <laughs> I found him standing on the street, just staring at some electrical wires. <laughs> and then when I asked him, what are you doing? He was like, I'm not looking at the wires. This is Philly. I'm looking at them shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Why would anybody put shoes up on a wire? Was it a typewriter artist who fell? <laughs> And that is all that is left of him? <laughs> what exactly happened here? A tightrope artist. Yeah, that, wow. Yeah, I never thought to think that. Yeah. But if I came from another time, yeah, that's what I You might think of that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But really, it's just some brother walking around without sneakers. Because <laughs> he ran into the wrong people in Philly. <laughs> the only city where they don't steal your shoes. They throw them up on the wire so that you can look at them every day. <laughs> yeah, man, those were my shoes. <laughs> Wait, can we get back to Ben Franklin? Oh, ben Franklin. Okay. <laughs> ben Franklin. Wait, so you, so. I'm serious so, about Ben Franklin. So, did you bring him here? When, I thought by now he, Ben Franklin. Ben. <laughs> ben. <laughs> You're very kind. Benjamin very Franklin. Kind. It was Thank just you. an Uber I was getting into. You didn't have to be afraid you of it. You just wandered off. I, <laughs> I, you left me just standing there. Can we get Ben a chair, please? It's do we have? <laughs> <laughs> You're too kind. How do you do, Ellen? It's nice to see you. Thank you. How do you do, Good to see sir? you again, Ben. Good to see you as How well. How are you? I'm very well. I'm excellent well. You're very kind to ask. Nice to see you all, my friends. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you. You're very kind. You're too kind. So, so, Ben, Neil, did, you got a chance to see, Phil, what do you think of Philadelphia today? Wait, don't take my money. I <laughs> thought that was, <laughs> I'm sorry. You don't even know what this is. Time is money. Um, yes. that, is, <laughs> that is legal tender, Ben, with your face on it. Uh, did he not, he said it had my face on it, I think. Yeah, it's totally there on your face. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, tell me, what do you think of Philly today? It's enormous. It's wonderful how much it's expanded. Um, when I had come to Philadelphia as a runaway from Boston, it was a town of only maybe 6,000, 5,000, 6,000 people. Wow. 1776, Philadelphia had become the largest city in the new colonies, um, perhaps with 60,000 people, perhaps at most. Uh, it was only at that time, I think, at that time there was only one city in the world with over a million people that would be uh, Beijing, London perhaps was well on its way, but I've certainly never seen a city with millions and millions of people together. Wow, okay. And back then, did the traffic suck as much as it does now? <laughs> the traffic. <laughs> the, the roads were in terrible condition during the Pennsylvania Convention while we were, we had to cover all the roads with gravel because it was making, the, the carriage wheels would make so much noise on the cobblestone and it was a tripping hazard. You don't want to be in a cobblestone city. So, so Ben, you were a successful printer. In fact, from what I've read, you were quite wealthy. So is that wealth give you free time to then do cool science things? Because I don't think anyone was paying you to do science. That is true. No, that was, would be the purview of a gentleman. I, you're absolutely right. I did have some success uh, with my printing, specifically with my almanac. Did very well. Um, a poor, poor Richard's poor almanac? Richard. Poor Richard's almanac. And who, and it's who, wait, uh, let me ask Elf. Who the hell is poor, is poor Richard? <laughs> Well, poor Richard is a character Franklin made up. He, uh, in Philadelphia, he, he, I mean, he just had to make a buck. 
he had to make a living, and he saw that almanacs sold really well. And so he wanted to make one himself. And he, in fact, was such a cutthroat competitor. His almanac was funnier, wittier, it just obliterated the competition because he created this character called Richard Saunders. Or Richard. Or Richard. And Richard Saunders, in the preface to the first almanac, <laughs> says, kind reader, uh, I'm an honest fellow, but I got this wife back home who's really, like, hammering on me to make more money. And so to please her, I'm doing this almanac because I know they sell really well. Um, and I never, ever would have done this if it hadn't been for the fact that Titan Leeds, the other almanac maker in town... Far more popular than me at the time. Uh, that Titan Leeds, we know from predictions in the almanac that he's going to die on a certain day. <laughs> wow. <laughs> And he no also, idea. because he's a great predictor of things, he also knows he's going to die on a certain day, but, but we differ about which day it's going to be. Uh, and so, although I'm a good friend of his, I thought maybe now's the time for me to get into it. Well, <laughs> Titan Leeds had no intention of dying. And when he read that, he went nuts. And he went hopping around town saying, I'm not, unlike you, I'm not dead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not dead. And there was such excitement, and Franklin just outmaneuvered him in every way. And before you know it, his uh, leads just folded, and his almanacs flew off the shelf. But here's a connection to science. As soon as Franklin's almanacs became really popular, he was able to add more pages to them uh, because the everybody, everybody was buying them. And what did he do? He starts putting articles in there about science. Mm -hmm. Ooh. He, took, he took articles that had come over from London and he would reprint them in the almanac because it wasn't enough for him to learn about these amazing things. He wanted to educate everybody about them. So what is the Junto Society? Does that have Well, so after, um, after having published the uh, Almanac for a number of years, at the age of 42, I was able to retire and sell my business, and I would never have to work again, and this is when I had begun... At age 42? At age 42. Wow. And this is when I began the pursuit, seriously, of science. But, um, but earlier, I had been in London when I was 19, and I had seen other clubs, the TIFF Club, the Tuesday Club, and I had created a club when I was I a working man in Philadelphia called the Junto with other like-minded working men. Eventually we were joined by ship's captains and together, Junto of course being um, it, uh, in Latin for um, joined together, Junta Jucant. Yeah, I knew that. I joined knew that. together, <laughs> they assist. Join together, they assist. And so together with the Junto, with this club of like-minded people, we were able to uh, better ourselves, better our community, and eventually we together founded um, the first uh, library, uh, subscription library here in America, which still exists today, and the first science academy, the American Philosophical Society, wow. which still exists in your day. I was recently inducted as a member of the American Philosophical Society. In fact, they are based here in Philadelphia, and that's how I found Eleanor. They told me about you, yes. Neil is like the black Ben Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> no. well, so, so, but. Well, they have a number of my um, little improvements and my of course, but rattle I'm, traps. What I'm asking is you, you create this, you create that. There, and at no time have we yet even talked about Ben Franklin as a diplomat. And that's how most of anyone thinks about you as a founding father. So how did you have time for all of this? Uh, well, time machine. Time is, um, it, it requires um, concentration and a schedule. I have um, a certain mathematical um, attitude towards time, just as I have to everything. Um, I, for instance, if one wants to live a good and virtuous life, one must um, create 
a moral compass or moral algebra if one is to have enough time to do everything one wishes to accomplish. Uh, must one, one must allot the time and one must devote the time to it. And so I created a very rigid schedule, which for the most part, until much later in my life, I stuck to and allowed myself to wake at a certain time, to prepare my letters at a certain time, to devote a certain amount of time. I also became I, rather I, I obsessive. I believe that the translation of what Ben is trying to say is, we did not have the internet. Yeah. <laughs> I was not. <laughs> Or Netflix, I, right? Right, so or Netflix. At, at night. Right. And we <laughs> certainly did not chill, ever. <laughs> but nothing is done in a vacuum. We are, I am working alongside, I mean, I'm inspired by so many greater men and working alongside so many other great minds. So, so Ellen, from your records, um, when did Ben transition from the bringer of science to people to the doer of science? When, when was that? Well, <clears throat> one of the first um, one of the first things that he did in uh, in a scientific realm in America, I think, was uh, by the way, if you don't know, we can find out because he's sitting the, right I here. Assume, but the yeah. transit, the study of the transit, is that what you're thinking? Well, go ahead. You no, no, please, please. You've read my letters more recently than I have. <laughs> 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 No, talk about the transit. <laughs> well, the transit of Venus, I actually, deal. you probably know Indeed, more about this. Indeed, the transit of Venus is a very important Did you have a, You probably had a chance to study it in your lifetime yes, as so well. Yes, so Venus, twice every couple of hundred years, will move between Earth's vista on the sun and the sun itself. And that, when observed from different parts of the Earth, enable you to triangulate and get a precise distance to Venus. When you do that, it allows you to get the full measurement of the entire solar system, where the distances to all the planets, because previously you got distances just in units of the Earth-Sun distance, but you didn't know exactly how, how far that was. Exactly. So everything was in unit of Earth-Sun, but the transit of Venus transforms that. And you would have seen the transit of Venus in the so it, 1780s, is that well, right? Well, so in 1761, we have one, and unfortunately I'm not able to see it, but we begin to see it studied. Also in 1761, there's war taking place that's going to interfere. But I think it's in 1769 that we are able to participate globally. So we have Mason and Dixon studying it. Yeah, we yeah. have um, David Rittenhouse creating a telescope yeah. and studying it not far from here in Norriton. We, and I'm, in fact, I'm in a, um, we build an observatory just behind the Pennsylvania State House, and some years later, the uh, Declaration of Independence will be read out loud from that same platform where we will track and study and time the transit of Venus in order to come up with this final number that will finally give us the, um, the distance between the sun and the earth. Yeah. And we came up with the number of 90 million miles. That uh, was so wrong. It's 93, so wrong. Yeah. It's 93 yeah. million miles. We were ben, very wrong. Then get back to the drawing board. Yeah. <laughs> That's ben, correct. Your life has been wasted, sir. It was an absolute <laughs> failure. Uh, uh, before we take our first break, let me just bring this to, an, I think, an interesting close. That transit of Venus was also viewed by Captain Cook, Captain Cook on an expedition from England. And that was best viewed, uh, that was best viewed from the South Pacific. And so England says, go to the Captain South. Cook, go to the South Pacific. Yeah. Here are new tools to measure the transit of Venus. Oh, by the way, by the way, could you map every coastline you see? Whatever landmass you had to give it, let, just, just, just on the side, go ahead and do that. He measures the transit of Venus brilliantly, comes back to England, presents the maps of Australia, New Zealand, the, I, the Cook Islands, all of this, and within decades, England takes ownership <laughs> of those <laughs> landmasses. Right. Just That's take right. a look at all the flags of those countries, 
okay? Half of them have the Union Jack inserted in it. That's traceable to Not Captain still. Cook. Many of them do still. Have they learned nothing? <laughs> 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 we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to delve deeper into Professor Franklin's scientific career on Star Talk Live at the Keswick Theater. All right, we're back. Keswick Theater. Star Talk Live. We're outside of Philadelphia, and who better to talk about is one of its finest, most significant citizens of the past, and I would say even the present day, is spirit energy remains with us in this part of the world, and I would say around the world itself. You're very kind. That Benjamin Franklin. Give, give up for yeah. Benjamin Franklin. And of course, Ellen Cohn, who is the editor-in-chief of the Benjamin Franklin Papers Project, which is being conducted out of the Yale Library. Yes. Oh, so Ben, let's talk about your most famous experiment, which I, as a kid, didn't understand, and I still don't. Fair enough. What's up with you and a kite and a key? Ah, yes, electricity. What the hell were you doing? Why, why, who, what, don't you know that's, it's dangerous? Oh, I do know that it's, I didn't, that's why I did not fly the um, kite in the, in the storm. My, um, my, that's my the son, legend. I, I, had, I stood in a little paddock and my son William flew the, oh. uh, <laughs> if you're, if you're going to perform. Father of the year there, that's it. <laughs> if you're going to perform a dangerous um, experiment, may I always suggest um, placing your progeny in, da they, they, they can't sue you, uh, mostly because they can't sue you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so what, what, was your, what was your objective there? So, um, so I, we're working with the American Philosophical Society. We're doing experiments. I have retired, and I am corresponding with a friend in England at the Royal Society, Peter Collinson, and he sends me a wonderful new invention from the University of Leiden, Leiden, known as Leiden Jar. Normally, these sort of inventions, these innovations would have been um, named after the creator, but in this case, the creator was a, a Professor Musselbach. I don't think anyone's going out and buying a Musselbach jar, so we called it a Leiden jar. And he so, he, so Peter sends me one of these, and he says, perhaps you'd like to consider understanding how it works, learn how it functions. And we begin by, uh, very, would you like to describe well, well, so the Leiden what jar, a Leiden as jar I, As I remember from my physics training, it's a jar that's sort of electrically insulated from what's around it, but there are metal sheets inside of it that, that if they become charged, they just sort of resist each other, and you see them just sort of separated, sitting there, perfectly happy, separated. That's it's right. kind of opposite what gravity would otherwise have them do. So in a way, it has trapped electricity and in this I, volume. That's right, and what I'm going to do is take a dozen of them, uh, 18, and put them in a box and wire them all together and create, instead of just producing electricity, electrical fluid, by rubbing a piece of wool Don't on a glass that. tube, um, <laughs> I'm going to create an electrostatic generator, an enormous oh. machine, and now I'm going to have rows, so imagine, if you will, rows and rows of these jars all sticking up. Well, I won't take your walk. R just imagine, and now I can store quantities of the electrical fluid in it, and it is rows and rows of these jars sticking out of a box, as if, to me, it appears like a row of fouling pieces or cannons sticking out of the top of a balustrade. And do you know what we call that? A battery. How, how, oh, a cannon sticking out of a balustrade? <laughs> a battery. A battery. <laughs> yes. And that is what we're going to do. We're going to try oh, and invent okay. and name the battery. Okay. And we're going to once again fail, um, but it is going to <laughs> inspire. <laughs> Gotta start somewhere, Ben. But it's going to inspire me to perform, I don't know, Ellen, 130 separate experiments. And eventually, it will lead us to the understanding that the electric, well, it will lead us to many understandings. It will lead us to, most importantly, it will give us a vocabulary, a language, a nomenclature for studying this new fluid. 
So, so. Is that why you needed the kite and the key? Well, so ultimately, the kite and the key is going to prove the final experiment, which is that one form of this electrical fluid is the discharge of lightning. Mm -hmm. And we're going to take some electrical um, uh, 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 charges from the, sky. from the sky, not from a lightning bolt, that would be in lunacy, um, <laughs> and we're going to put it into one of these capacitors. Okay. We're going to take it back to our laboratory. We're going to perform a series of experiments with it, just how quickly can it burn a piece of paper? How quickly can it? And then we'll take another battery filled with electrical fluid created from a generator, and it will perform exactly the same way. Therefore, we will prove that these two seemingly different substances are, in fact, the exact same thing. And at any time in this experiment, does it get you back to the future? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently so. <laughs> I would have said no. <laughs> so just to put us on the same page, uh, every time it rains I anywhere in the world, there are electrons that used to be up in the sky, in the clouds, that have arrived on Earth. And electricity doesn't like being imbalanced that way. All right? These are from ions that come out of the... the, the the rain swelled skies. And so the electrons collect. Now, if you happen to be under a thunderstorm, there'd be a lot of those electrons collecting locally. The electrons want to get back to the cloud, but they're really lazy, <laughs> okay? And the last thing it wants to do is move through air, because air is actually an electrical insulator. Right? It hates moving through the air. So, when you build up enough charge, the charges look around and say, wait a minute, I see a human being. Let me go up into the human being. Now I have five and a half less feet I have to move through the air. Oh, right. wait a minute, there's a tree. Let's go higher yes. up, okay? There's less air that I have to move through. Wait a minute. There's a church steeple. Mm. Let's go up to the tip of the church steeple, and we will discharge there. And so lightning, there's a le what's called a leader stroke that is exploring what path between the sky and the ground requires the least stress on the movement of these electrons. It finds the path, it's called a leader stroke, in the moment that leader stroke completes, the electrons surge back to the cloud, and that is the lightning bolt that we all see that most people think comes from the cloud to the ground. But it's the electrons that had accumulated going from the ground back up to the clouds. Now, so you died because of a bunch of lazy electrons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. So if you're the tallest one in an area, you are susceptible, okay? Anytime lightning hits a baseball game, who does it hit? The tallest one. No, we, we can do better than that. The pitcher. The pitcher, Up on a <laughs> the pitcher is right. just a little bit closer on the pitcher's mound. And that leader stroke, the moment it comes out, you actually will feel the static electricity. So if, the, if you feel your hair rising up because you start accumulating these extra charges. If you start feeling the hair rise up on your skin, drop to the ground immediately. Because what's happening is the electrons are gathering and they're ready to make that jump, the, they're ready to jump. But if you drop low in that instant, You'll then you will confound this exercise. Oh my God, where do we go? <laughs> Then <laughs> you know, I'm just sitting here trying to be a lazy electron. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> what just happened? So, just a little bit of elect. Uh, and by the way, when they launch rockets, you ever notice there's the launch pad in the middle, and there are four towers. There are multiple towers. There's a water tower as well for other reasons. But there are four towers that compete with the rocket to attract lightning. So if lightning is if, if the electrons are ready to come up and go back to a cloud, the rocket is not their first choice because we've supplied them with a way to go back. And this reminds me of one of Professor Franklin's 
most brilliant inventions, the lightning rod. Yeah. Yes. Dude. So you did good there. Thank you. And in fact, I, I, Ellen would know better than I. There is a French uh, natural philosopher who is able to attract charges during a bright sunshine. We see at the time that I'm in France, the Italian uh, Signore uh, Volta um, expanding on these ideas. Yeah, so the Italians, the electricity is, has an imprint of all the people who were fundamental to its progress. So Alexander Volta is a, uh, the Volt is named after him. Not the Chevy car, I'm talking about <laughs> the volts of your battery. There's Ampere, amps come from, I think Ampere is French, uh, Ampere. Uh, so all of these names and terms come, there's even a, uh, there's a Faraday, there's a, um, uh, but all these words we have for electricity, like you were saying, Professor. Doctor. Say again? I was never a professor. Okay. You can just uh, call no, me Ben. Ben. Just Ben. As we were saying, Ben, that, I can't call you Ben, that's too... Uh, call, the, behind my back, the other um, members of the Constitutional Convention called me Dr. Fatsides. I, <laughs> really? Okay. I, <laughs> they were uh, not even, what I'm going to call you It then. wasn't even the worst insult among us. If you, ben, I prefer they were, Ben. Today, we, we don't body shame people that Thank way. Thank you so right. much. Yes, 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 yes. So yes, Ben will be suitable. So, so with um, the lightning rod, you now give the electrons a place to depart Earth so that they don't randomly find some other thing like a church steeple and destroy the church steeple. And in Boston, they kept tearing down the lightning rods for fear that I was, they believed, from the pulpit, suggesting that I was somehow um, creating an accumulation of electrical well, fire. Well, so I, I, I left something out, excuse me. So Please. The lightning rod is so brilliant. It, was, it may have been more brilliant than Ben knew because, oh, watch what happens. So, you have the lightning rod, which is just a piece of metal sticking up, and it's the highest point of your structure, all right? So the electrons gather. If you make the lightning rod a point... This is important. Then, the electrons, on going to that point, ready to go to the cloud, they'll leak off, and they'll just sort of drizzle off into the sky. So, lightning rods not only reduce the chance you'll get struck by lightning. If you're struck by lightning, it saves you from destruction. But this was a very important argument at the time. People, the debate over a dull-topped lightning rod versus a point, a very sharp point, was something we took very seriously. All the electrons crowding there, they spill out. It's very crowded, and, and you can spill electrons back and basically never have the lightning strike that would have otherwise taken place. It's just brilliant. Now, let me, let me ask you, Ellen, I heard this, and I just, I just want verification. I want to see if you have it. Before the lightning rod, by the way, this is the 1760s, 70s, what's the tallest structure in any city in colonial America? Church, okay? So what structure is most likely to be hit by lightning first? Church. So... If there's a church here and a church there and a church there, and that church gets hit by a lightning, I got a story mm. in my church, right? They say, That was the false church, people. Yep, that was the false God. Clearly, God didn't like your church. Didn't like your church. Good way for me to get more churchgoers into my church by Good holding church. that argument. But then Ben comes along and saves all the churches. I heard that there was criticisms, I don't know if it was heresy, <laughs> of Ben thwarting the will of God. Right, exactly. which, is why, I, I thought, I which thought, is why we had to help it along with something called Jesus arson. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus arson? What? Because <laughs> Ben put up these lightning rods, these churches aren't burning down, and God told me to just burn your church down. <laughs> what? Is so... That, so that's not was not my intention. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. So, so Ben. So, for me, the idea that you would be accused of heresy for thwarting the will of God, I'm thinking to myself, how 
powerful is the God you're worshiping <laughs> if Mr. Fatso can prevent them from destroying your church? <laughs> that, this is my thought. So do, is there any correspondence related to this? Oh, he, he got immense criticism mm. um, from people all over America and Europe, too. Um, most people believed that lightning was God. Of course, divine. Yeah, was divine. And not, just, not just in modern mm. religion, but you go back to Zeus. ancient religion, Zeus. And, you know, they, and, and um, did Thor wield the lightning Thor. bolt or just a hammer? No, Thor called on ha uh, lightning. He called down lightning. With his hammer. With his hammer. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. And I got that from Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, you know what else? Inside churches throughout Europe, uh, there weren't just people inside there. You know what else they used to store in churches? Uh, the parts of dead saints? Gunpowder. Yeah. Oh, that's smart. <laughs> Yeah, you know that place that just keeps catching fire for some reason more than any other place? You know what we said? Let's put some gunpowder there. What, what? Well, Gun just uh, only, what, 20 years before I was born, 20 years or so, 30 years, was the Great Fire of London, uh, 1666, not yeah. too long. So this and what did they keep in their churches? Minds. Dynamite? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no, because these But dynamite was invented by Alfred Nobel much later. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, so I, I, I don't spend that much time in Clearly, churches. I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> it's where he made his money to leave the trust that would give the Nobel Prizes. Yeah, dynamite, TNT. That's, that's yeah. somewhat disturbing, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. That okay. the man who created the stuff that blows things up also made the Peace Prize. <laughs> <laughs> you have to give a prize for peace? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, yeah, we need that. Otherwise... Unfortunate. There may be even less incentive than there otherwise would be hmm. to create peace in the world. Um, but but I, Ben, I want to before we take a break, I want to get to your other experiments. But tell me what other critiques that were handed down. Well, um, one of the ways that Franklin countered this argument was to say, uh, you know, God sends rain. And that doesn't keep us from putting roofs over our heads. Brilliant. Um, ben, that was good. Ben, that was good. <laughs> Look at him. He said, yeah, that was me. No, I was yeah. thinking you made me I love it. He was like, like that what? was me. <laughs> 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 I don't remember how clever I was. <laughs> <laughs> I sound even better when Ellen tells me. In, 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 in the middle of the summertime, the sun is really strong. That doesn't prevent us from carrying parasols. So why should it be? that if the deity gives us the knowledge to um, understand these phenomena, then why shouldn't we take advantage of that knowledge to protect ourselves? I'll tell you why, because the next thing you'll be telling me is that I need to get vaccinated, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's why! As a matter my of body, fact. My body, my choice! <laughs> Wait, 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 Ben, what's this oil and water thing you did? Ellen. Would you, would you like to tell them about like a, 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 a bead of water spreading out? Yes. On yeah, so here's the thing. Even from the earliest age, Franklin, uh, being the observant kid he was, and young man, as he was crossing the ocean back and forth, he noticed that when the cooks dumped the cooking oil overboard, the waves smoothed out. Why is that? Why is that? He kept on thinking about it. And much later, when he was living in England, he thought, uh, he was talking to people about this phenomenon, and he said, I'm going to do an experiment. He took a little bit of oil, and he carried it to a pond that From he knew Mike about. Hay. And, uh, thank you. Um, and he put the oil on the surface of the pond on a windy day to see what would happen. And to his amazement, because no one ever expected this, the oil smoothed out the water. It became right. smooth as glass, but it didn't stop there. That smooth area kept going and going and going until 
to everybody's amazement, half an acre of water was absolutely flat. And so covered by a tiny bit of oil a, a introduced to it. A teaspoonful of oil. Mm. He would have loved Exxon. <laughs> <laughs> well, but uh, you know, in our time, there was practical applications for this. Um, oyster divers would put a little bit of oil and it would allow them to see their catch. Oh, because otherwise the, the turbulent water disrupts the optics yes. of what's below. And when I first heard this, I say, what? Oh, I, I get it. All right. So if you ever freshly wax a car and you put a bead of water on it, it just sort of stays there, sort of propped up, all right? So that's called surface tension. And so water has pretty good surface tension. It'll just sort of stay there as a bead. If you Could put too I much water there, it'll spill off, but just a little bit of water will stay as a bead. If you do that with oil, oil has very low surface tension. So it won't bead up. You put the oil there, it'll just spread. It's like a lazy electron. <laughs> <laughs> it'll just spread. And what we would learn after the fact, because of this brilliant experiment, because it's not only what do you see that intrigues you, it's what do you do that creates more things to be intrigued by, that the oil, under the right conditions, would spread to one molecule thick. And so you can calculate the size of the molecule based on the volume of your teaspoon and how much area it ended up covering. This was, it's just brilliant. That is brilliant. And that was the experiment that was done based on Franklin's observations and his writing up that experiment. At his time, they didn't understand the composition of a molecule. They didn't have the word for molecule. Yeah. I don't know uh, what a molecule but is. <laughs> not long, not long after he died. You had elements, but you didn't have atoms. Atoms That's right. were not understood. Yeah, yeah. And so that was the seminal experiment that got other people thinking about how that could be used to measure the thickness of a molecule. Ben, this requires very high standards of measurement, of, uh, a, and you have to be careful about your own bias that could influence a result, mm -hmm. because then someone else will check your results, and if you find out you didn't. D take the notes right, that would look bad on your reputation. That's so, right. So well, there is nothing more inspiring than when you have an experiment that fails but can inspire another scientist to improve upon no, no. it and What's find No, What's more inspiring truth. than that is doing an experiment that succeeds. Oh, well, no. that would, <laughs> I, uh, clearly I have very little experience with that. No, no, but, uh, <laughs> but you're absolutely right. The, the null experiment can make a very interesting starting point for others. So w given your that you're in it, you're doing it. What, what, did you have tolerance for, I don't know what word you might have had in the day, today we would call it pseudoscience, where people in denial of science, people who did not see, care, or appreciate what the scientific methods would do, did you have any sense of that? Uh, there's world? so much of this. And of course, you must understand, we're living in an age where new ideas are being introduced, and it's sometimes very hard to determine which ideas are true or not. I can not think of what, can you think of an example of a pseudoscience from my age? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's have I put you on the spot? No! I, just nothing pops into my mind right away. Oh, but but, but did you, what was your attitude towards it? Let me ask that. Oh, that, uh, not good. <laughs> okay. Well, a perfect example, we mentioned the almanacs. I'm trying to, all of the calculations I did for my, astrono for my astronomical um, Right, the charts. sun, moon, and stars, yeah. I'm doing all of that. Well, and also we would do Mercury rise. Um, okay. We, um, I worked closely with a scientist who started to um, study and trace uh, what would eventually become known as Uranus. Um, and this, I Uranus, think. Uranus, we say. Uranus, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Not Uranus. Uh, Uranus. But Uranus. Yeah. Uranus. Okay. Very right. good. Yeah, yeah. Very good. But that would, be, uh, he, the discovery would come later, but, but no, I, the, um, but this, of course, was why we would need a library to have these, um, to have these, I, I mean, it comes back over and over to Pliny, to, yeah. uh, to Pliny, Newton. Pliny, an early documenter of all knowledge. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Newton, who I never had a chance to meet, but would have been, in my time, these great inspirations. Uh -huh. um, these are doing the best science. When we fail, uh, we hope to inspire others. When we see people who are simply uh, projecting their own bias or their own 
religious beliefs, are, like the idea that electricity gathered with a lightning rod will cause earthquakes. Oh, that right. would be a, a pseudoscience of my age that was very common. Interesting. Well, here's an example. There was a guy during Franklin's lifetime who published an article saying, I've invented a pair of shoes that can allow me to walk across the River Seine. Now, that seemed to be easy to test. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking, you don't need a grant from the National Science Foundation. By the way, <laughs> if you buy those shoes, you deserve to be ripped off and maybe even drown. <laughs> well, you know, society was filled with people who were trying to make money off of a uneducated, credulous public. And that was one of the reasons why Franklin, at every turn, tried not only to do his own experiments and hold himself to those kind of standards you're talking about, but also educate other people so that they wouldn't fall prey mm. to the kind of nonsense that sounded good if you said it with the right kind of authority. Mm. He hated that. Yeah, none of that happens today. No. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, imagine, for example, that someone tells you that they have recently witnessed a man leave the Earth and float 6, 7,000 uh, feet, 6, 7,000 feet above the city of Paris. Yeah. That might seem um, unlikely, and yet this was something I witnessed in my lifetime, the first hot air balloon. So we are living in a time oh. of it, uh, what yeah, seems to be... Yeah, it's a little be... different than a man floating <laughs> up from the ground, No, ben. no, it's really... Well, Sorry, Ben, I'm just letting you know. It's, it's, it's lighter than air. It is, yeah, but it it's is. a balloon. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's still a but balloon. It's the first time you see it. Like, no, if you just took off flying right now, I'd be like, whoa. <laughs> Well, I that have, is something. Have, but if you jump in a balloon, I'll be like, oh, look at that, he's in a balloon. But you've never seen a balloon before. Oh, well, except as a toy, a child, children's toy. Okay, that toy. makes sense, yeah. yeah. So when the bonk off I forgot, you've been dead a long time. <laughs> <laughs> we all seen balloons. You, but <laughs> <laughs> Nobody here is impressed by a balloon. <laughs> so, Ellen, what you're saying, not to put words in your mouth, you're saying, in that time, there's a lot of challenges and issues communicating objective scientific truth to a public that is otherwise gullible in many ways, and that's kind of no different from what we're seeing today. Yeah. Yes. Today we call it uh, the Nigerian prince. <laughs> Hi, I just need some money that you can give me for just a little bit, and then I will give you back 10 times as much. Wait, wait Ch Chuck, weren't those in emails from 20 years ago? No, it was the email from Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> What's an email? All right, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to find out what Ben was doing in France during the Revolutionary War when Star Talk Live from the Keswick Theater continues. <laughs> we're back, Star Talk Live, Keswick Theater. <laughs> I got Chuck Nice, my co-host. I've got Ellen Cohn, editor-in-chief of the Benjamin Franklin Papers Project up at Yale in New Haven. And we've got none other than Ben Franklin himself. Good evening. Thank you, Ben, Good for evening. coming out for this. So we know that the American colonies were very friendly with France through Jefferson and through the diplomacy of Ben Franklin. And, of course, while we're fighting England, the French are always looking for a good fight against England anyway. So they were sympathizers to our cause. And very shortly after our revolution, they had theirs, right? So, so I'm going to ask you, what brought Ben to France? And what was he doing there while, while in residence? <coughs> well, actually, it was not at all a given that France was going to help the American colonies. Not at all. All. We are in not sure if we want to help you, colonists. <laughs> 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 you do not have the hard French soap. You smell like peasants. 
So does every French person you imitate smoke a cigarette? Or this is what we do. We were bombed with cigarettes in our hands. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Continue. Th never mind, Chuck, on the corner there. Okay, go. So um, when uh, the Patriots gathered and wrote the Declaration of Independence and pledged that they would risk their lives on this cause, the question was, how are we gonna win this war? I mean, it's one thing to declare a war, it's another thing to fight a war when you don't have guns, you don't have ammunition, you don't have Chips. any place to go and buy tools. The colonies relied on England for everything. And now all of a sudden, not only do they declare their independence, they're cut off from their supplier. So they sent Benjamin Franklin to France to try to persuade the king of France to support a revolution against another king. Now that was not going to play necessarily, because kings kind of like... Yo, kings rule with king. <laughs> real recognized, real. <laughs> so why did they choose Franklin to do this mission that was in fact not at all a sure thing? The reason was that by the time 77, 1776 rolled around, he was already by far the most famous man in America. Why? Because of his lightning experiments. His science. His science. And it wasn't just that the lightning rod was saved millions of lives, and it wasn't just that he invented the battery. Most people considered the most significant thing about his experiments to be that he proved that something that was invisible in the atmosphere was actually electricity. No one had any concept of that before he came along and proved it with the kite and the key. So his legacy preceded him in Europe. Yes. He was immediately made a member of the Royal Society, which was the greatest scientific organization in England. And he was made, and this was astonishing, because the French don't do this very often, they made him a member of the French Academy of Sciences. The Academy Francais. Mm, wow. So mm -hmm. he was, when he arrived, now Congress sent him over to France in top secret. He was on a ship that if it had been captured, he would have been hanged. So no one had any idea that he was actually on that ship. And when he set foot on French soil, the French went nuts um, because they already knew who he was and they loved him. So it was his scientific Science. reputation. I, I, I did not know that. So are you telling me that if we sent Neil deGrasse Tyson on a secret mission to talk to Vladimir Putin? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I, no, I, <laughs> <laughs> that there could be a possibility yeah. <laughs> that we might be able to get something done. Yeah. O okay, this is very encouraging. I did, uh, this is beautiful and, and brilliant, and uh, I, I'm deeply moved by this fact that science in the day would be elevated to become something even greater than diplomacy itself. Because it sat, sailed above popularity contests or anything else, or the seizing of power. It recognized brilliance. And, and that gives us deep hope, I think. Yeah, and let me tell you something else that's totally inspiring. Um, you mentioned before about Captain Cook. Yes. Well, after that voyage, they sent him back. You remember this? Yeah, he had multiple voyages, yeah, yeah. And Until he didn't. Well, that's... <laughs> but I, I was in Hawaii once, and I, I was watching Don Ho, okay? That's how old I am. I was watching Don Ho. And someone asked him at the end, what happened to Captain Cook? And Don Ho said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't seen him in a while. <laughs> so, <laughs> rumors are that he was eaten by He locals. was, he was. Yeah, yeah, okay. So here's the thing, during the war, during the American Revolution, Captain Cook 
Uh, well, actually, they didn't know it in London, but he had already been in, put in the pot. Uh, but the rest of his boats, the rest of his ships. Somebody had Captain Cook for dinner, yes. But the rest of it, but his ships <laughs> that had. <laughs> Sorry, that was low hanging fruit. <laughs> I had to say somebody had Captain Cook for dinner. And they enjoyed it. Yeah. Okay, we heard on. it the first time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Ellen. We'll shut up. Please continue. Well, uh, so word reached uh, Europe that. Captain Cook's ships were on their way back from this voyage of exploration and discovery. And Franklin was our ambassador in France. He couldn't communicate with Congress. There was no way to do that. A letter might take six weeks to go and six weeks to come back. He had to act on his own. So when he found out that Cook's ships were traveling north, he issued on his own initiative an order to every single American captain sailing on the ocean, leave those ships alone. Not only leave them alone, but if you meet with Captain Cook's ships, now keep in mind these are British ships and by rights any American would have been authorized to seize them. Franklin said leave them alone, in fact give them any assistance that they might require because they're on a mission, a scientific mission, mm. and science should be in a plane above politics. Wow. When word reached the Royal Society in England that Franklin had done this, still in the middle of the war, I mean the war was like at its height, the Royal Society voted to give him a gold medal. Mm. And the British, the, the British Admiral, the head of the British Admiralty wrote him a letter and sent it to him. Um, and you can just imagine uh, what this meant to him. Yeah, I mean, if the world recognizes your work, that goes beyond just whatever satisfaction you get recognizing yourself. So, so that, just the congratulations. I'm far too humble to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But wait, but that wasn't, it didn't stop there. Europe turned dark in 1783. Oh, this is interesting, Ellen. For mysterious reasons. This what? is while I'm in France. In 1783, this is the same time that we are writing the Treaty of Paris. The war will be coming to an end soon. So tell me what happened then. Well, it was this amazing, terrifying thing that happened. Um, in the summer of 1783, hadn't yet signed the treaty. The sky all over Europe turned dark. The sun was just this dim little uh, uh, disk in the sky. When the sun set, it was blood red. People were terrified. That summer- And they got all biblical probably, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. That summer was super, super, super hot. There were thunderstorms. People were dying. Livestock was dying. Nobody knew what in God's name was going on. And that continued for months uh, into the next winter, which correspondingly was the coldest winter on record. And so at a certain point, I mean, scientists from all over Europe were writing to each other, trying to figure out what caused this, what's going on here. Um, and Franklin, very tentatively wrote a letter, uh, a little essay, which he called Meteorological Conjectures, because he wasn't sure, but he analyzed the situation and he said- well, the, the sign of a good scientist is if you don't really know for sure, you don't say that you know for sure. And the really okay. good ones never say they're sure. Certainly. Because then they can never be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. So what he said was he thought that it was possible that the particulate in the air was actually ash and gases from a volcano in Iceland that he had read a story telling him that this huge explosion had happened, eruption. Um, and it turned out he was absolutely right. 
Uh, it and that happened just a few years ago, even. Ten years ago? Yeah, around there. Yeah. A uh, uh, volcano in Iceland the erupted. The same volcano. The same. They had to stop all air traffic. Yes. The airplanes, yeah. we invented how to fly, just so you know. Okay. Mon Coffier, we, <laughs> we, I've seen men, <laughs> air balloons. So, because jet engines take in air, and if the air is filled with dust from a volcano, that is bad. Yeah. But if you look at prevailing wind patterns in the rotating Earth, generally they move west to east. That happens in the United States, it happens over Europe. And I, I wonder how we determined that that was happening in the United States. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Remember sorry. how he said he's so humble. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I, I proved that uh, weather appearing to come to Philadelphia from the northeast was in fact coming from the southwest, hence the nor'easter uh, oh. term that I... Mm. Sorry, please continue. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so... I wouldn't even call that a good guess. I mean, he had to really think through what that is and yeah. what it meant and arrive at that conclusion. Yeah. Mm. Ben, what could you tell me about Mesmer? Friedrich Mesmer. Yes. Me so Mesmer had been going... Anton. Anton, thank you. Anton Mesmer. Friedrich was pretty good, too, though. Friedrich. <laughs> Anton Mesmer. Anton Friedrich, uh, Friedrich von Steuben. So uh, Anton Mesmer is going around uh, Europe, the, co the continent, claiming um, a, new, a, a new form of medical treatment, which will eventually become known as animal magnetism, this quality that rests within us. And he can treat it. And he has various techniques, and eventually he, um, this, mes uh, this, this abnormal magnetism can be affected, um, he claims, by a musical instrument that I had invented known as the glass harmonica. And eventually he finds his way to France while I'm there as our minister to France. And I will let Ellen take over from this point and let you know what happens <laughs> when Mesmer, Antoine Mesmer, and his animal magnetism s begins to and this practice. Is the same, this is the in same Paris. Mesmer as the, that w gave us the, the mesmerize. To mesmerize. Yeah. So this okay. mesmeration, the, mesmerizing. That's the part, same Mesmer. Okay. This is part you know of this you same. You know you can't resist me. <laughs> this is the same. The, the music is very. Um, well, the music is incidental, in fact. Please. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he used music, but he, then he didn't use music. Here's the thing about Mesmer. The reason he came to France is because he was kicked out of Vienna. This is a guy, this was a doctor, who gathered people around, turned off the lights, put his patients right in front of them, stroked their thighs, Usually I'm not women. kidding you, uh, and then he would look deep into their eyes, mesmerism, and then he would tell them that whatever was ailing them, he could cure. Sounds like a human resources problem. <laughs> <laughs> and people believed him, and folks flocked to his clinic. They believed it because they wanted it to be true. Well, nobody understood that until... He claimed he could cure blindness. Mm. Mm. Claimed he could cure all kinds of things. And so he gets run out of Vienna. He comes to Paris, sets up clinics. All these French people come, pay tons of money. They're all having symptoms and twitching and God knows what. And the government's getting really worried about this guy. So... They, the king of France, appoints a commission of the greatest scientists from the Academy of Sciences and the greatest doctors from the Academy of Medicine. And they say, you got to investigate this guy. Now, what's best, this is one of the most important incidents in the history of medicine of the 18th century because, just think about it, Nobody could see this magnetic fluid. And they put Benjamin Franklin on the commission. You can understand why. He was the guy who had identified this invisible force in the sky. 
uh, now there's a doctor claiming there's some invisible force that he can manipulate. And only he knows the secret, he's not telling. So how do you like get at this? How do you figure out whether it's true or not? And one of the most brilliant things about this commission was they, they conferred, they tried to think, how do we devise experiments to get at this? And they came up with this idea. Animal magnetism uh, can exist without being useful, but it cannot be useful if it doesn't exist. So the science contingent said, before we do anything else, we have to see if we can prove whether this invisible force exists. And they did, over the course of four months, a series of controlled experiments that are mind-blowing. And they wrote up a big report that reads like a detective novel. It's so well-written, and you're just on the edge of your chair. The one experiment that was the one that clinched it, that animal magnetism didn't exist, <laughs> they had a doctor who practiced magnetism, and he went and he magnetized a tree. Apricot tree. Yes, in my garden. In Franklin's yard. And they said to the guy, now you can bring with you a patient, you choose the patient, uh, and we're going to test, you can blindfold him and see if he can feel anything from the magnetized tree. Now, this was a little boy, 12 years old, and I don't think they were counting on the fact uh, that <laughs> the kid would be blindfolded and that when the doctor magnetized the tree, they would be, the kid was like inside the house. So there could be no communication. Well, the kid with his blindfold uh, went to the wrong tree and start shaking and having convulsions and God knows what. Anyway, it was <laughs> obvious that this was a, a bunch of hooey. The word is bullshit. All right. <laughs> yes, sorry, excuse me for this thing. But I here's just. the next part of the story that is mind-blowing. After they proved that it didn't exist, it was Franklin who had for almost all of his life been thinking about how the mind can affect sensations in the body. This is the key. Mm -hmm. And so they devised a series of amazing tests that we would call double-blind experiments where they had patients think that they were being magnetized when they weren't. They had patients sitting there not knowing anything go was going on with the doctor, like shooting death rays at them. Um, they did all kinds of variations, and the conclusion was this thing worked if the patient believed that it would work. Mm. And this was the moment in the history of science when uh, what they called imagination. They said, animal magnetism doesn't exist, but it seems to be true that our own minds are able to cause all kinds of physical sensations in our body. And this led to uh, what we call the placebo effect, all kinds of things like oh, that. That's fine. I this like, is I like that term. Well, they did the wrong experiments. If they wanted to know if animal magnetism really existed, all they had to do was put Chuck Nice in a cocktail party. That's <laughs> <laughs> how that works. <laughs> but, this no, but this is a very important notion because I have tried in everything I have endeavored to serve the benefit of mankind. And here we have an unscrupulous doctor practicing what is clearly an unscrupulous um, technique. But you wouldn't have known that until you could demonstrate it and have That's everyone it. else but what convinced if, of it. But it, what if it serves some purpose? What if it is useful for some? What if they believe themselves to be healed? I, I don't mind that, but just don't call it science. Call it something else. <laughs> so I'm going to summarize, if I may that the life of Ben Franklin was not so much enumerated experiments. His entire life was an experiment. And I'm reminded 
in, in, with the starkness of the detail here, just in, in blunt detail, that an experiment is the boundary between what is known and unknown in the universe. What is unknown and unknown for you. So experiments are something to be cherished, something to be cultivated, something that we should continue our entire lives lest we ossify in whatever was the last course we took in school, and then you think that's the understanding of reality. <laughs> but reality is continually being explored by the likes of Benjamin Franklin in modern times and we hope continuing into the future. Yeah. And the more people who think that way and participate in that exercise will transform civilization as we know it because we need it because we need to become better shepherds of our own future that right now is driving off a cliff. Yeah. So, thank you all for coming. This has been Star Talk Live at the Keswick Theater. Thank you, Ellen Cohn. And Chuck Nice. Excellent. Mitchell Kramer as Benjamin Franklin, ladies and gentlemen. Very kind. All of you drive safely, stay safe. As always, keep looking up. <laughs>